I don't think this is no more an objective. Just I want to, to climb well, but that's not exactly the same as uh, doing the hardest route you can do. It takes us to places and situations distinct from those of everyday life. It puts us in settings where we feel our own strength and that of the natural environment. It introduces us to diverse people. Reaching into the life beyond the crag, climbing weaves itself into the identity of those who experience it. At its core, climbing is a practice of movement, a freeform experience drawing from a broad spectrum of the body's abilities. But equally, climbing moves the mind by demanding fluidity, precise movement, and competent decision-making in situations involving fatigue, intimidation, or genuine risk, climbing poses a dilemma. The responses that undeveloped instincts pull us toward inhibit climbing ability. The responses we desire are the hardest to muster in the situations climbing presents us with. This ongoing tension between the responses our instincts pull us toward and those we can create through a careful process of intention is a source of climbing's intrigue. In the words of 1993 German champion Mariette Uden, mostly I climb on intuition. This, for me, is the optimum state. When I see, grab, step without thinking, it flows. Ähm, mehr intuitiv unterwegs. Ja. Also, und das ist auch für mich das ist optimal beim Klettern, nichts mehr denken. Mhm. Wenn ich irgendwie nur noch äh, sehe, greife und trete, und, also wenn es fließt, ja. und nur noch niemanden nachdenken. Ja. Her words point towards a reason for seeking improvement, toward the motivation for what Mark Le Menestrel described earlier as his objective of climbing well. Improvement leads not simply to higher numbers and smaller holes, but to a qualitatively different experience. It's not a question of the difficulty of the routes you do, or your performance relative to other climbers, but rather the inevitable richness that comes as you gain tiny increments of mastery over something so hard to master. You sense this when you're working on a difficult move, and you find a subtle shift in the body that replaces grimace with grace. You see it more clearly on the days when experience shows itself. Your climbing clicks, and you feel smooth and fluid on moves that normally require excessive effort. You know it in your heart on those rare and precious days when the many skills climbing demands come together at once, weaving preparation and spontaneity together into one unforgettable ascent. Yet these moments are rare. As Germany's top red point climber, Andy Hoffman, puts it, so many things have to fit together. You have to have the right body, the right head. It all has to fit together. In sports like cycling or running that involve the repetition of relatively few movements over and over, it's easier to predict one's performance. But on rock, so many factors contribute to climbing well. The unusual challenges that Udo encounters during this climb are unlike those on other routes. Finding his way through the labyrinth of stalactites is about as far away from the polished granite domes of slab climbing as a Mormon missionary from NWA. Yet both these extremes lie within the range of challenges climbers make their own. 
Since climbs routinely surprise us with unexpected styles of moves, the challenge of climbing is inevitably a challenge of learning to master diversity in technique and skill. Thus, climbing well, by necessity, involves learning to climb well on many different types and angles of rock. You don't want to be able to do a one-arm pull-up on a finger edge, then fail on a 5-7 friction climb. This diversity can make climbing more frustrating and mysterious than other endeavors. Well, you can get so frustrated on a route like that because you fall off and you just look down at what you've climbed to get there. And you look at your fingers and you look at how much skin you've lost to get there. And, and you, you think about the hike that you fly through <laughs> every day. Yeah, or the trip that you made to Smith Rock, you know, and how many rest days it's going to take. And you go, man, I paid such a high price for the chance of these last three moves. The climbing isn't satisfying despite its frustrations. It is rewarding because of them. The complexity that makes it possible to sometimes fail when you expect it to succeed, and to succeed when you expect it to fail, renders proficiency at any level at once elusive and priceless. If climbing well means mastering diversity, then the expert climber is the one with the fewest weaknesses, the climber most comfortable in diverse terrain. The adept climber doesn't get stumped by a sequence simply because it doesn't suit him. In what follows, we present the views of climbers themselves. Their words paint a picture of the sports participants. We'll leave it to you to extract what you're ready to bring into your climbing. What is the diversity of climbing? The climbing environment is constantly changing. The rock varies, the holds change, the texture can be slippery or grainy, crisp or biting. Even the light, the wind, and terrain that frame our climbs are never twice the same. Equally, the internal environment climbers bring to the cliff varies from person to person. You need, I think you need to enjoy what you are doing. If it's become too hard, <laughs> Your mindset determines your results. In many ways, what you expect from climbing is what you get out of it. When Udo arrived at this area along the coast of France, he and his partners were captivated by the unusual beauty of this recently discovered climbing area. He was drawn to the unusual lines the climbs took, and before knowing anything about them, he simply wanted to climb them. But it turned out the average difficulty of the climbs here were quite hard for him. By igniting a desire to climb and to be in an area, experiences like this fueled the desire to improve. You don't need to get better to enjoy the many satisfactions of climbing but improving broadens the range of experiences available to you. You can develop your coordination and technique. You can build your strength. You can fortify your body for the special needs of a particular type of climbing and learn to find mental balance within an unstable environment. And through this process, improve your ability to climb regardless of circumstance. As such, the richness and depth of the experience grows with ability.
I take more and more pleasure climbing than it's worth it. Learning to climb well is a lifelong quest. For while physical aspects may not move steadily forward for a lifetime, many factors more central to climbing performance can. One's technique and balance may continue improving at any age, and one's knowledge of the self and its changing states of readiness for rock always grows with experience. Here, Gunda Fruvald, 1992 German climbing champion, mother of 10 years, and last summer, the first woman to climb 513C in Germany's power-demanding Frankenjura explains. What do you think about the common belief that athletes reach their peak with the age of 25? If you can do it, I was probably too late. How old are you? 42. And what do you think? What does the future hold for you? For now, it's going well. Otherwise, I just have to climb easier. But I'm confident that I can still improve. Do you feel that you have any disadvantages since you're older? No, for me personally, I don't think so. I'm feeling fit, in great shape, and I will improve. Consider Jacques Le Menestrel, who, in the following cut, climbs a V7 in Fontainebleau. Since Jacques started climbing in the 1950s, climbing has experienced dramatic changes. As climbing evolved, so did Jacques, who can now make hard boulder problems in Fontainebleau look like a walk in the park. To take a closer look at improving, We've chosen competition as a model with which we can examine the different factors that contribute to climbing performance. By allowing a comparison of climbers on the same route, the same day, in the same conditions, competitions allow us to sort the foundations of performance from the frill. In competition, a course setter like Juby Tribot here at Arco designs routes to challenge competitors. Ideally, our roots moves present a wide array of technique challenges at roughly the same difficulty. That way, competitors fall off at different points according to their weaknesses. Competitors assemble from around the world, bringing the unique style and approach that their home area has cultivated. The competition is a judgment day, separating wheat from chaff, fact from facade, the world class from the local heroes. Here's 16-year-old Pavel Samoyan, junior world champion, previews the routes before the finals of the 1991 World Championships in Frankfurt. <laughs> The challenge of building a competition route is making a fair division of the climbers according to their skill. Ideally, only one reaches the top. But if one can reach the top, it might be too easy, and the second-place climber makes it also. 
It's such a fine line between too easy and too hard. In the following section, we'll compare Japanese Yuji Hirama and Frenchman Francois Legrand on the same route, showing them side by side as they climb the men's final route. Before competitors climb, they wait in isolation, so each attempts the route on site. They'll climb one after another according to the order of their performance during earlier rounds. During the tense wait, competitors prepare themselves mentally and deal with the pressure of knowing they have but one attempt. Below the climbers will track the duration of time elapsed for each from the last good hold they left 25 feet above the ground. Here they are. Yuji on the left and Francois on the right. Forty feet from the route's start, they climb the first crux across an overhanging traverse midway through the route. Francois makes a long cross, turns toward the audience to minimize his swing coming out of it, and goes immediately into a figure four to economize strength for the long reach that follows. Yuji misses Francois's crossover and climbs back and forth before opting for a slower sequence involving a strenuous match. This match was the downfall of competitors like Didier Rabutu earlier in the competition. At the end of the traverse are holds offering a chance at recomposure before the honeycomb wall, stalactite roof, and final head wall ahead. Since Francois finishes the traverse faster, we'll freeze him here and wait for Yuji to catch up. After battling with the match, Yuji struggles to reset his left hand and dinos the long reach. Iron crossed between the two holds, he falls onto his right hand. Later, he clips from a less efficient position before finding the heel hook rest that Francois assumed immediately. Note that Yuji spent an extra minute and 20 seconds on the strenuous overhanging traverse. Watching Francois, one thing becomes clear. He moves quickly, decisively, and makes the fewest movement errors. In climbing, the sum defect of tiny movement mistakes or inefficiencies adds up fast. The best climber is not necessarily stronger than the rest. He's the one who makes the fewest movement errors. It's the choice of moves and positions and the speed with which they're chosen that separate climbers. It nearly always feels like you fall off because your fingers open or you can't hold the hold. Believing it at that, however, misses the essence of climbing. Whether your fingers open or not depends on how you move and how efficiently you've gotten to where you are on a route. Climbing is a movement-centered sport. As they move into the honeycomb wall, Francois takes advantage of the dihedral for a more efficient reach and clip. Yuji climbs the overhanging honeycomb wall alone and clips from a more strenuous position. The dihedral stem takes weight off his hands and offers a moment of respite after the clip. Yuji thus climbs slightly quicker to the stalactite roof, motivated more by the urgency of fatigue than the resolve of strategy. He spent almost two minutes more on the strenuous 13C route at this point. Although we criticize Yuji's mistakes, it's important to note that he's probably the world's second best competition climber. In fact, no other competitors reach this point on the route. But his mistakes in this competition shed light on critical aspects of climbing performance and on the nature of climbing in general. Yuji's sweat reveals the extreme fatigue he now faces. Lactic acid, passing the blood-brain barrier, interferes with his coordination and his cognitive abilities. The extra time he's spent on the route now has caught up with him. 
Both competitors struggle with the unusual feature in the roof. Yuji starts at the final headwall and changes his mind to return for a last chance rest. Francois makes the clip from the stalactite. Almost forgetting to clip, Yuji does so from a strenuous undercling. The difficulties of the final moves are too much for Yuji in this state of fatigue. Francois climbs on to become the first official world champion. The extreme power endurance required on a route like this leads to a buildup of lactic acid that interferes not only with coordination and cognitive abilities, as mentioned, but also with maximum strength and flexibility. This makes power endurance the most difficult issue to manage in physical training. how you have to push on your foot in order to, to not sleep. And that's, that's fun, that's not, uh, I think it counts a lot. to read it's less subtle there's not as many tricks rock climbing you have to work your feet a lot more unless you're unless you can learn how to figure out the plastic so it's like rock climbing like this problem is like rock climbing because the feet are difficult and the body positions are difficult but, and it's painful like you get in positions you don't like and you have to get out of them fast so it's not fun a lot of the problems you do in here are really fun good holds far apart or small holds close together with good feet, but it's not like rock climbing. But it becomes more transferable to the rock. Because I spent three years in here climbing on pleasant holds, like good holds, fun moves, you know. But you go to the rock and it's always like, ah, like really thrutchy, you know, it's not positive, it's always not fun. But you have to learn how to do that. When you go on site, you have to do stuff that does not feel good. You don't always have a good undercling. You don't, it's not a power thing. It's not always like, can you lock this off to here? It's like, how accurate are you when you're in pain? Can you can you stick it even though you're in pain? You know? No matter 
no matter how crimped your fingers are or how bad your feet are, you have to like know that no matter how painful it is, you're going to have to grab it and pull off of it to, to do the root, or you might as well go home. No one's creative enough to do what, the, what happens on the rock. No one gets that creative. Nobody has the energy to put into plastic that's already out there on the rock. Besides, it's only plywood. Plywood and plastic. You know, it's not... There's no real challenge because it's always someone else making it up. It's not nature against you. It's not random. It's very... I mean, you always know how good the holds are. There's always good texture on it, you know? You go on rock climbs and the holds are really slippery and they're always like, not really good. You know, you can't do that in here. Nobody has fun on it, so they go, ah, just grab good holds, you know? It's just as good. But, pulling on, pulling on rock is the best, for sure. Because you always get stuff that's gymnastic-like plastic, but it's also more random and harder to, harder to predict, you know? In here, if there's something that's too hard for me to do, I just do something else, which is bad for me. I need to learn to do everything, you know? Just learning moves, no matter how stupid they feel, or how impossible. Like this move took uh, about an hour and a half to figure out the movement to do it, but at first it felt impossible, absolutely impossible. And that's how rock climbing is. Sometimes you go to a rock climb on a move, even on easier routes, and it feels stupid. Like, you, you can't believe that it's been done, and you think you'll never be able to do it. And then once you learn the body position, or the timing, or the speed, then you know that it's not that bad. It's just how everybody else does it, you know? You can be strong, but if, if you don't know how to use it, then it's pointless. If you can't keep your shit together when you're in pain, then you might as well go home, you know? Like, it doesn't matter how strong you are. Mike just offered a perspective on the contrast between indoor bouldering and outdoor climbing. Now Dale Goddard and Martin Yoiston prepare to climb Rapture of the Deep at Idaho City of Rocks. There are many different styles of climbing movement determined by the rock on which they take place. This route involves excessive crimping on relatively small edges with blank rock between. The climbing emphasizes long locks, high steps, and dynamic moves. In a few moments, we'll look at other types of rock that demand different climbing techniques. In Fontainebleau, for example, the only way to succeed on many of the boulders is with a precise, controlled style. Thus, the boulder problems rated V7 to V12 on the Wenko Take scale that Mark Le Menestrel and his father, Jacques, demonstrate in a moment will look easy. They simply cannot be done in another style. On G.B. Tribot's long project, Bronx, which we'll see later, however, the biggest challenge is maintaining good technique despite a growing fatigue over the course of the route. In the final scene within this technique section, Dale Goddard will demonstrate a training exercise using closed eyes to develop spatial awareness. First, let's look at some of the underlying principles of coordination and technique. At every instant, whether we are moving or not, our brains receive sensory feedback from our limbs. These signals come from nerves in our muscles, tendons, joints, and skin and tell the brain about muscle contractions, body positions, and forces acting on us. This constant stream of kinesthetic information is the source of our body awareness and allows the brain to oversee and control movement. Moves that are quick and precise, like this crux move of rapture, exceed the brain's capacity to control simply by monitoring feedback from the body. So instead, the brain executes them by recalling moves from memory in packets known as engrams. Different climbers bring to the crag different repertoires of engrams based on their experience. Thus, Martin finds a different sequence at the crux. He finds a drop knee position to the left, saving three strenuous moves. The best climbers are those with the broadest repertoires of moves. They can adapt to the different styles of climbing.
well, I, well, I could say it's not a particular uh, Fontainebleau just to, 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 to have power. You can, you can climb Fontainebleau with a lot of power, and you don't need a lot of technique if you want. But you can also climb in Fontainebleau in a different manner where uh, you, um, you try, first you try to be technical. And um, my father and uh, um, uh, my father, when, when he teached us climbing, the game was, um, you know, to put as much power on your feet that, that you, um, you are just at the limit where the foot is going to slip. You just have to push on your foot, just the stronger as you, the stronger you can. But and if you slip, that was too much. But you are you are always at the limit of the slipping of your feet. So you do that, and after the rest, the the power, the, the weight, you can't put on your feet. You just have to put it on your finger. But that's the second step. First is just to push on your feet, and that why we did some um, one hand uh, uh, currents with, uh, with uh, my father or my sister or my brother or other friend of mine that are, have been climbing Fontainebleau for a lot of years, for many years. And these people are more interested in making moves, having fun with, uh, with climbing, and not just making hard, hard palms. You know, this is not the most important always. You, you just have to do the hardest for you. That's exactly the, the objective of the game. Mm -hmm. The game is just to, uh, you have to use your, foot, your, your, your finger only uh, if you can't put, put the weight on your feet. And the more, the more weight you put on your feet, the better you are. So when I climb with my father or with uh, Laurent Carlo, for example, it's usually, they climb better than me. Because sometimes my father put more weight on his feet than me. So he, for me, I'm learning a lot of things just looking at my father or looking at other friends that perhaps they don't make 8B or 8A prime in Fontainebleau because there's no 8B at all. But, um, they climb better because they, are, they can just use more the, the, the horns than me. The power is just uh, above that, after that, after technique, after concentration, the rest, you use power. But the least you use, the better you are. And you also think that for a problem like Lange Naive, there's still an advantage that you stand on your feet well and that the technique yeah, is right. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It's perhaps nobody will uh, will uh, will trust me, but I, I don't care. That's not that's not only just being snub about technique. It's you know you have these two hedges for for your feet, and the way you you're going to push on your feet is is really important because that's the power you, you can go to, 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 uh, to the top. And you know, it's the way the foot 
is, uh, is used is not just um, simply you put your foot and you push on it. You have to, to, to have a move with uh, this part of the foot just to begin like that and to finish like that. And you have a rhythm, how you, you have to push, a tempo, how you have to push on your foot in order to, to not slip. And that, that's fun. That's not, um, I think it counts a lot. It counts. When Jibé Trubeau first made the moves on his longtime project, Bronx, they caused a sequence of nerve impulses unique to each movement to occur in his brain. After repeating each movement several times, that pattern of impulses became ingrained in memory and stored as a motor engram. Engrams contain the directions to reproduce living versions of moves stored in memory and act as packets of preset muscle instructions to reproduce each particular move. The performance rock climbing book offers a more complete presentation on motor control. The moves on Bronx are so difficult that they can only be made with near perfect technique. The challenge of such a route is knowing the moves well enough that even the technique crippling element of fatigue cannot undermine the ability to execute them properly. Yeah. Uh, for me, I try to, when I bump, I try to stay technique. Uh, to keep a good technique because uh, like that in your mind you you stay technique when you are front and it's very important that you go inside or even after work. But it's the most difficult thing to do. Sissa can replace thousands of conscious signals. Using engram memory to control his moves makes it unnecessary for Jibé to constantly monitor all of the kinesthetic feedback from his body and send out corrected signals. Jibé climbs smoother, quicker, and he can make more complex movements with still enough free consciousness to oversee his fatigue, time his brief rests, and adjust his strategies for the pitch as a whole. This explains why hard red point performances are characterized by a quiet mind and a sensation that things are accomplished without thinking about it. Although the roots and boulders we're showing are extremely hard and the climbers are among the best, the lessons here are applicable to climbers of all levels. We've chosen hard routes for the video because they allow a smaller range of technique solutions. On moderate routes, a good climber could demonstrate an inefficient technique and make it appear appropriate. But it wouldn't necessarily be the best or most correct technique for that move. When Jibé falls in a moment, it's not that he's too tired to hold on. He's too tired to use a technique that allows him to climb efficiently and within his strength limitations. When he retries the move after resting on the rope, Jibé positions himself closer to the wall and sags lower before initiating the momentum that will carry him to his target hold. We've chosen top climbers because they have the broadest repertoire of techniques to show, and we film them on routes at their limit to guarantee that the techniques they use are the most appropriate for the moves they're on. The fact that the climbers make their routes look easy is not inconsistent with their extreme difficulty. A movement that looks more graceful generally is more efficient. Thus, the hardest moves require a technique that appears aesthetic and light. A move that looks hard cannot be near one's limit. You know, it's going to make a difference whether you know even the really subtle things that your body does or whether you do them unconsciously. You know, if, you, if you don't know it that well and you wait until you're in progress on a move to think about where your foot hangs when the other foot's on a hold or when that foot's not on a hold, it's going to take an instant longer to really make the move and you know, get the foot there and make the move. If you know that, oh yeah, I've set my right foot on the hold and then my left foot flags out left and just props against the wall. If you know that in advance, then as soon as you make the move preceding it, that foot's already on the way and, and going over there. And it really, yeah. you know, it's just another instant save. And you know, if you add up a couple hundred instants like that saved over the course of a route, it's big time savings. And, you know, on a route where it's steep like that, time is everything when you're on the strenuous sections.
basically what I look for. Like this one's really good because you have to move your hips at the same time. And so many times I feel like when I do dynos, um, if I'm nervous or uptight or run out or whatever, I tend to only move a, a certain part of my body, like my arm, the arm that's making the dyno, or um, you know, maybe just my upper body. And it's because you know when you get nervous or you get uptight, I get I contract unnecessary muscles, and that's why I like hold my legs tight or you know my abdomen is like cinch tight. And if you're moving like that, if you're not fluid, you know it totally cuts down on your reach. It cuts down on your your ability to get there efficiently. So I'll do this one a couple times. Open eyes to get the feel, and then see if I can do the eyes. We all have a lot of spatial awareness, and the problem is we're used to using our eyes as a real crutch for that. When we also have awareness that comes from our body, and you know, for example, if you're driving, you don't have to look down to grab the gear shift because after you've driven your own car for long enough, you just know where it is. You know it in your in your body, your arms. Your arm knows exactly where to go, and if you train that sense in your climbing, you can develop that ability to the point where you can look at holds and then know where they are, even though you might not have done them before. You can look at them, size up the whole spatial arrangement, and then your body knows where they are. And then once you've got that, you can, you can move faster, you can have more precision when you're going to hold because you know, you're using both your eyes and that sense, that body sense of where they are. What makes this one hard is that you have to be pretty accurate to get into this two finger pocket. And also since the wall is a little overhanging, you don't have nearly as much time as you have on a vertical wall. On a vertical wall, you know, you can kind of feel around and find your way into the pocket on the way out, you, you know, when you're, when you're not looking. On here, you do a little bit of that, but you have a lot less time. So it just makes you have to be that much more precise in knowing where you're reaching. And basically, the idea is that you do it a couple times with your body, and you build up your own body awareness of where the holes are in space. And then, to solidify that, and to get a feel for it, with your closed eyes, you do it again. And, and then you're relying on this picture in your mind, this three-dimensional picture of where things are. And you can also feel a lot of things with your eyes closed that you just don't notice with your eyes open. You really feel how fluid the movement is through your whole body. When your eyes are open, it tends to focus your awareness just on what you're looking at because you're getting so much information from that. So when your eyes are open, you tend to have a lot more focus on what your arms are doing, how you're grabbing the holds, what, you know, what you're doing from here up because that's what's in your field of view. And then with your eyes closed, your whole body is in your field of view because you're using that mind image of where things are. So it really helps you to make the move efficiently with your whole body. And is to do it for a few more rounds so that you're projecting your spatial awareness even farther. And it's helpful for remembering how moves feel. It's really helpful for, you know, when you're rehearsing a route, you're trying to go over it in your mind, practice it accurately. This kind of thing gives you practice in knowing how moves feel. And, you know, in addition to stuff that we were doing before where really getting precise with remembering where holds are in space. Um, you know, what, what I like to do is kind of early in the season, I'll do a lot of 30 minute sessions on the wall, 30 minutes of uninterrupted climbing. And most of the time I'll just do that bouldering because it's you know, hard to belay, take me to uh, get a belayer to do that without falling asleep. But, um, you know, they're really good for a lot of reasons, but they do last 30 minutes, so you've got to find something to make them interesting. And um, you know, what I would do is I'd just come up with little, little games or little exercises like this that uh, just to make it fun. And um, you know, one thing I would do is I would while climbing, I'd just kind of develop these little boulder pumps. I'd climb in and out of, practice them over and over again, and you know, then I'd try and do them with my eyes closed. That's one thing I do among a whole bunch of others. But, um, so I'll try and do one here. What I like about the sequence is that if you do it really smoothly, your momentum never stops. You never have points where you stop your momentum and then start it again. With each move, you have a swing going, 
you capitalize on that swing for the next move. And so by maintaining it, you don't ever have to reinitiate it. something you like to do. You you put out all your energy in a different direction. And then when you return to climbing and put out your, your energy back into climbing, it's fresh again. And, you know, it's, it's a shift in focus. And, and it also, you know, it's, it's I think it's hard when you always talk to climb. I mean, it's fun for a climbing trip or for a short period of time, but to, to always, always be living and talking climbing, I think can be you know, And if you... Too much of it. Yeah. What are my advantages? Well, I think I can follow my goals in a more relaxed way than the younger ones. I hope I can credit myself for not being overly ambitious. If I know that I can do a hard route, it just doesn't matter if I have to go there one more time to do it. I can approach it in a relaxed way. What is so scary? Yeah. Nothing special. It's uh, the problem is that you have to uh, jump all your body. Yeah. On a but you're used to this in from Fontainebleau, aren't you? Yes. In Fontainebleau, it's okay, but you have the ground, so you, you know uh, you can in your mind you can uh, know exactly. Okay, you try the move, you fall, you down in the in the ground, but everything is in your mind. When you do the move on, you jump everything, but after, you know, it's air, it's nothing. 
But it's not so, so far above the uh, the board. It's not the board in, the, uh, in your feet when you when you do yeah, the yeah. the board. And uh, but it's just I mean just impressive. And also it because the move is very hard. So it's also because you can't control the move. Could yes. You? Yeah. Yeah. That uh, wouldn't be so bad if you could control it. If, it and if you can control, you have no. I mean, it's not impressive. The problem is you you are out of control. That is. I didn't, uh, I didn't try for one year, it's for that first yeah. time you are a little, uh, it's a little difficult and after the second time it's, it's finished, after yeah. I feel, uh, I feel okay. Yeah. First time it's a little, you have to remember uh, the, the feeling of like that jump, uh, jump all your body and fall, but after the second time it's, uh, it's okay, you learn the, the route and it's okay. some mistakes. We've had some seconds. Flash of energy you have to uh, you have to give, and you know you can use uh, um, you can uh, uh, what is really important is just to, to be able at one time at one precise moment just to like that just put all your energy in into one move, and that's what is uh, uh, so funny with uh, Fontainebleau because you have no constraints to do that. You just you know you have. Uh, you start from the ground, you prepare yourself, and uh, you prepare to, uh, to, uh, to give all your energy at one time, and you have just to move, and then just do it. You just, it's quick, it's, uh, it's simple. It's uh, something like uh, 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 just moves, just, just climbing, no other things, no protection, no, uh, uh, no problem if you fall, just you have to, to do the move.
c'est dur I had the problem last year that I didn't make definite decisions to either do hard routes or competitions. I tried to do a hard route here, but then a competition came up and I tried to prepare for that. I never felt really satisfied with the outcome of both. Now I know that you can't compete on the international scale and do hard routes in the Frank Neura at the same time. Auch bei keinem richtigen Erfolg hatte. Und deswegen habe ich mir eben in dem Winter auch klar das Ziel gesetzt, nächstes Jahr erstmal schwer. With this in mind, I made a conscious decision last fall to concentrate on hard routes here in the Frankenura. Hard routes here are never more than 10 to 15 really hard moves long and take about two minutes to climb. That means you have to increase your maximum strength. Starting January, I did six weeks of hypertrophy, three weeks of transition with pyramids, and three to four weeks of intramuscular coordination or recruitment training. After that, I started bouldering again to transfer the strength gain to a harder route, to a harder route. How long do you actually have to do this? Intensiv trainierst. How do you warm up? 20 to 30 minutes just with climbing. Now I look much more for weaknesses. In former times we just said, oh yeah, power, I need a lot of it. We didn't even know what weaknesses are. I think much more in scientific categories now, because it's pretty much known what you have to do to increase your strength. With my training I have total control about what I want to work on. I do these basic exercises to work on the issues I want to improve with various loads and intensities depending on what phase of training I'm in. I'm also absolutely injury free since I started doing this kind of training. If you just go bouldering for strength gain, there's always a lot of peer pressure that just makes you want to do these problems regardless of the how bad they are for your tendons, etc. If you do this all winter, you might finish your winter preparation training with some injuries already. To transfer the strength gain onto the cliff, I rebuilt my project as much as possible. In the route, you actually get it more like that, and you have to turn it like that. But that's difficult to simulate. Then I go to that intermediate, as in the route, and try to turn it with this pumping motion.
glaube schon, dass das ist ähm, von den Grundvoraussetzungen her. I think I'm talented for climbing, since I have a lot of natural finger strength to start with. Finger strength is a limiting factor. You can't improve it as much as big muscle group strength. It's not only the finger strength, but also their anatomy and how injury prone you are that is important. I feel I'm talented in this regard. I used to compete in gymnastics for a very long time. I always was athletic, and doing taekwondo for a really long time helped my flexibility. I started um, splitting my training into endurance days and power days. And my power days were on-siting um, on the plastic routes that were harder and then getting on the campus board and, and doing a lot of bouldering. Um, and then the endurance days, I'd, I'd stay on the wall for up to 45 minutes, just constant up and down and up and down. And then I'd, for my partner, I would switch. And then I'd do, you know, possibly three sets of those. And, how hard did you climb during your 45 minutes on? Just, just hard enough to keep the light bulb, but not so hard that um, you just had to all out stop climbing mm -hmm. and you fell. Mm -hmm. So, if, you know, not that, not too hard. Anything up to EC 511. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then toward the, the spring, I started to do more power endurance and, and, and trying to do both on the same day and then doing more days in a row. So. Mm -hmm. So I really am kind of experimenting with different, different and then ways. Back when you were doing the power and the endurance mm -hmm. the different, on the different days, yeah. um, were you going like two days on at a time? Mm -hmm. Or if so, which day was the power and which was the endurance? Usually the, the power was the first day, mm -hmm. yeah, with the endurance being the, being the second. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then a lot of times it would, I would try and have, if, if, I, if I was two weeks out from a specific competition, I, I would try and train harder the second week away than the week of the competition. Mm -hmm. I, al I always give myself two rest days and sometimes three rest days before the competition. 12, 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence starts. to another two finger pocket and sticking that's pretty hard because you really have very little time you know if you miss it or anything like that you have to have precision accuracy right into it went to the top yeah. went to the other one very small went down went up again yeah. went down again tried on the move and i leave the old thing She lost it. The hole is buffed. And you have to draw it. I'm not sure the condition will be enough. Well, the whole white section of the route is, is really technical. Um, but you basically have okay rests between the really hard sections. Um, getting up through about the, the fifth or sixth bolt is about 13A. Um, you know, got a couple crux moves on some real small edges, uh, another little pocket that we call the thimble that you can fit kind of one and a half fingers in, just about a half digit, a strenuous pull up on that. Um, then you get, uh, you get a rest down at kind of the first real chalky holds you can see down there. You get a pretty good rest. Um, 
do you know, a technical traverse on some real thin edges. Uh, and then you have the crux, which uh, the crux of that pitch, which um, some really non-positive holes. Like if you fall off, even on top rope, you can't really pull back into them because they're so non-positive. But um, basically, you make a real long reach to a to a kind of a pinch, this kind of wedge on the wall. Then you get a, another long reach to a pocket that you can get your ring finger in about three quarters of the pad. Your middle finger just kind of sits right on the lip of it, and you really have to crimp that. And uh, really extended position on all this because there's a lot of blank rock in between you. You stand up on this little this little crystal and make a kind of a, a tiny dyno to a pretty good edge. Uh, that moves real hard. You have to really feel, you know, for me, I, I pretty much have to feel completely fresh to do that move. Um, after that, you've got uh, about 20 feet of probably the easiest climbing on the route up to kind of a big rounded ledge um, and that's where you rest before starting the, the strenuous upper section. First time I saw it, I thought, wow, this is really much better rest than I expected just because the hold looks fairly large. But uh, the problem is the, the footholds there aren't really under the hold, so you're never really standing upright and uh, you know it's, it's still steep enough that you can't drop your hands and um, it's rounded enough that, it, you know, it's it's not a complete rest or anything like that. After that, it's kind of a gradual, ever-increasing difficulty to the top, basically. You've got a, a, a few bolts worth of climbing as it starts to get steeper and steeper. Um, you know, maybe 12 feet section in there to get up some pretty good holds before it, it all gets completely hard to the top. Uh, and what's neat about it is you've got so many different types of climbing. Um, so right at this point, for example, we're about you know, 20 feet into the purple. Um, at that point, you've got about uh, 10 feet of climbing on tiny crimpers, really small holds, especially for that angle. And um, yeah, you know, tiny crimping little edges, kind of long reaches on it. That's the part I've never really been able to do without grunting. The, the crimpy section, yeah, it definitely has the second hardest single moves for me. Then you get up to this pocket, it's on the photo of Jive on, on Climbing Magazine. Um, you can get a little shake there, but not much. You're not really going to get a whole lot back there. And from then, you clip basically the last bolt you're going to be able to clip on the route. And from there, you've got to punch it to the top. And uh, that's where it's really exciting because it starts off with what's probably the third hardest nerves on the route from me. Long reach to a two finger pocket. You have a little cramp. It's pretty steep here and you have to make this dead point to another two finger pocket. And sticking that's pretty hard because you really have very little time. You know, if you miss it or anything like that, you have to have precision accuracy right into it. Then from then, it's like long reaches to a side pull. Uh, step up and kind of dead point to another edge where it's really easy to have your feet cut loose, which is which is a problem. Um, another long reach to a side pull, and the very last two moves of the route uh, have the potential to be true heartbreakers because they're really small edges. The first one you grab, I mean, basically on a later move you stand up on it as a foothold, and it's a terrible foothold. But uh, as a handhold, it's even worse. It's, it's pretty steep there. You, Fortunately, you don't have to move very much off of it. You just kind of grab it and, and reach. You don't really have to pull your body up. But the hold you reach to is pretty bad, too. You high step on a decent edge and make kind of a reach across to the final jug. But uh, it's really easy to imagine falling off the last moves. And at that point, you basically fall the entire length of the purple section of rock, basically the, the length of the upper pitch. So. That's a factor too. I mean, the intimidation is definitely a factor in terms of working the route, climbing the route. It takes, you know, it takes, it takes time up there to get used to that. And if you're not really comfortable or willing to take the fall, you know, until you are comfortable or willing to take the fall, you're not going to be able to do it. 
kind of be relaxed enough to move enough fluidly enough to be efficient. Did your attitude towards the climb change? Yeah. Somewhere? Yeah. I mean, about the probably about the third day, I was feeling really cheery because, um, you know, I we've done all the moves and the moves weren't so bad. And if it were like any other climb. I was thinking, well, you know, a few more days and I'll be ready to red point because, you know, normally, you know, if you can do it in the moves, it's not so long before you're ready to, to start linking if you're in okay shape. Um, but on this, it's so long that the, uh, the fatigue that you get just adds up exponentially the higher you get on the route. So, you know, having a section like you have at the top of that route, you know, if it were on the ground, it wouldn't be so bad, but having it where it is after so much hard climbing, um, I, uh, you know, after, well, basically by now, you know, I'm, I'm much, uh, much more realistic maybe than I was after, let's say, about three days when I thought it was only a matter of a few more days. Yeah, what do you think now? When, when will we be able to climb it? Well, I don't even really think about it now because it's, it would be kind of a depressing thought, especially since, you know, I'm going back to Salt Lake in a couple days. Um, what I, what I think about instead is I just try and set little goals, you know, for what I want to do the next day or maybe the, the next two days. Um, you know, and I just try and take increments of progress from where I'm at right now. I'm recording. Seven in the morning, and uh, we prepare a hard day in Fontainebleau. This is uh, the way I want to be put. <laughs> the, the weather is kind of doubtful, Mark. Yeah. How it? Rewind. <laughs> 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 Rewind. <laughs>